Tuesday lunch on this beautiful January day. Um, I mean, April. <clears throat> so before we get started, um, I have just a couple of announcements to make. Uh, first, this will be, unfortunately, our very last Tuesday lunch. We had another one on the calendar for next week, but they had to cancel. Um, and so to that end, that means that this is my last lunch as coordinator. But we will have a new coordinator in the fall, and so I wanted to take a moment to introduce Christina, who will be facilitating the Tuesday lunches next semester. So Christina Steiner, Steiner is assistant professor in the psychology department. She joined the faculty at Denison in 2016. She's a developmental psychologist who looks at autobiographical memory across the lifespan. She works mainly with older adults, and her research often involves people telling her their life stories. She is interested in how personal narratives predict well-being and behaviors. She did her PhD at the University of New Hampshire and completed a postdoc with an autobiographical memory research center in Denmark. So please join me in welcoming Christina as the Tuesday lunch coordinator. Um, so yes, I'm looking forward to facilitating this next semester, and I hope to see all of you there. And if you are over the age of 55 and are interested in doing research with me, just let me know. I'd be happy to interview you. That's a shameless self-plug there, but here we go. Thank you. Nicely done, Christina. <laughs> Okay, and so to that end now for our very last presentation of the semester. Today I have the great pleasure of introducing my dear friend and our dear friend John Davis, Assistant Professor in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. And today John will be speaking to us about the racial politics of Japan's invisible race. John, welcome. Yay. <laughs> Thank you, Joe, for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here, uh, see some familiar faces and new faces. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about a research project that uh, has been going on for a while for me. Um, I've given different iterations of this presentation, but in light of the audience, I wanted to do something a little bit different today and talk not only about sort of what I find intellectually exciting about the project, uh, but also what I'm finding in light of the historical moment that we find ourselves in here in the US, you know, really disturbed by some of the difficult issues and questions uh, at the heart uh, of this issue that I'm looking at in Japan. Uh, in ways I didn't anticipate, um, I found interesting connections uh, between my research in Japan and things happening here in the US. Um, some that uh, informants in the field uh, helped me see, and others that began to uh, become apparent to me uh, only after returning to the U.S. and looking at how uh, we continue to grapple with uh, some of the same challenges that uh, I was trying to um, understand a little bit better in the context of Japan. So uh, at the start here, I'd like to um, begin with a, a quote, actually, uh, from a Swedish economist. You might be wondering, you're, you're an anthropologist, why are you taking a quote from a Swedish economist? Uh, his name is Gerner Myrdal, and he wrote uh, a book called uh, An American Dilemma, and it's a book that has been quite influential in both sociology and anthropology. Um, and what I love about it is, um, it echoes uh, what I see as uh, some of the sens sensibilities that anthropologists bring to their research, uh, 
Um, and because he's looking at the United States as someone from another country, another society, uh, he's able to find uh, a redeeming quality right, in our endless struggle to live up to some of our highest ideals. Uh, so let me read the uh, extended quote for you. The American Creed, and he defines it elsewhere as sort of the ideals of essential dignity of individual human beings, a fundamental equality of all people, and of certain inalienable rights of freedom, justice, and a fair opportunity. But he says the American Creed is not merely, as in some other countries, the implicit background of a nation's political and judicial order as it functions. To be sure, the political creed of America is not very satisfactorily effectuated in actual social life. But as principles which ought to rule, the creed has been made conscious to everyone in American society. Sometimes one even gets the impression that there is a relation between the intense apprehension of high and uncompromising ideals and the spotty reality. One feels that it is perhaps the difficulty of giving reality to the ethos in this young and still somewhat unorganized nation that it is the prevalence of, quote, wrongs in America, wrongs judged by the high standard of the national creed, which helps make the ideal stand out so clearly. America is continually struggling for its soul. Now, that quote sits with me for a lot of reasons. Right? And, and the biggest one, perhaps, is that as long as we're struggling, right, the battle is not yet lost. Right? So even in challenging times, difficult times, Right? There can be cause for hope. Uh, and this quote seems uh, to be relevant uh, today more than ever, uh, not just because of our political climate, but thinking globally and thinking about contexts like Japan, as we see the proliferation of discourses and, and practices of human rights and whatnot, um, which um, aim to hold all people right, accountable to the highest ideals, uh, we find ourselves falling short. And so part of me wonders if um, what I'm looking at in Japan uh, isn't just another iteration uh, of this dynamic that Myrtle so eloquently uh, writes about uh, in his piece. So I'm going to be talking about this issue uh, in Japanese known as uh, the Buraku Mondai or the Buraku Phenomenon. And so at the beginning here, I'd like to give a really whirlwind overview of this phenomenon uh, and preemptively um, address a few questions you probably brought with you, um, but at the same time um, lay the foundation for some robust conversation uh, at the end of my presentation here. So if we talk about uh, or think about the Buraku issue in Japan, uh, what are some of its features? Um, well. I've listed a few here. One is poverty, right? Historically, these were communities uh, that face a lot of socioeconomic challenges. Um, in addition to that, uh, there were often um, struggles, you know, sort of completing uh, education. Uh, many times, uh, children had to uh, help their families put food on the table, and so they didn't have the luxury uh, of being able to uh, complete their schooling. Uh, and of course, that had implications for their you know, long-term career prospects. Uh, Japan has long been what they call a gakureki shikai, right? Educational credentials play a huge role in determining uh, where you end up in the socioeconomic pecking order. Uh, so if you're not able to uh, graduate high school or get into some of the more elite and competitive institutions, right, that has long, lifelong implications. Uh, another piece of it, background checks. Um, you'll notice in the title I talked about Japan's invisible race. It's not a group that you can look at and, and sort of pick out in a room, right? Um, it requires uh, a different way of detecting, right, sort of who belongs to this group. Uh, and one strategy used by companies uh, as they're recruiting, uh, but also parents when they're checking out uh, the young man or woman uh, who's trying to marry into the family, uh, is they do things like use private detectives uh, to go and check out the community uh, where the particular individual is from, and certain cues uh, in the community can uh, uh, indicate right, whether or not one might potentially be connected to this group uh, called Burakumin. Uh, 
I'll say a little bit more about background checks later. Uh, marriage discrimination. Right? This is one of the uh, most poignant um, uh, manifestations of uh, the Buraku issue. Um, young pe younger people in particular are really sensitive around this um, um, question of you know, dating and marriage. And part of it has to do with, uh, again, the quote unquote invisibility uh, of the category. Right? If they don't disclose uh, their background uh, initially, um, months, if not years down the road of dating or seeing someone, uh, there can be this really awkward moment uh, where it's revealed uh, either uh, through personal disclosure or you, know, you take the person home to meet the family uh, and all of a sudden um, this can trigger a change uh, in the relationship. Uh, more often than not, uh, any friction that might result from that disclosure comes not from um, you know, the individual to whom you know, one is engaged, but really from the family members, parents in particular, uh, who fear um, any kind of uh, connection um, to this um, uh, discriminated against group. And finally, employment discrimination. Uh, many companies in Japan have been uh, discovered uh, to really be weeding out applicants um, by using private detectives, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but they also have lists, a registry, uh, of sort of known Buraku communities in Japan. So in some cases, a simple address is enough uh, to enable you to figure out who might belong to this group. So I talked a little bit about uh, the fact that it's you know, something you can't quite see, and you, you might be wondering, well, if you can't look and tell who belongs to this group, and what kind of problem is it, right? And does it make sense to think of it uh, sort of in the context of race? Um, I'll come back to the race question a little bit in the later, a little bit later. Uh, but in terms of helping you understand sort of the uh, historical backdrop of the Buraku phenomenon and how it is uh, people in this group came to be um, residing in particular communities, um, we can tease out different sort of historical phases. I won't go into all the minutia. Uh, but if we go back to the origins um, of this dynamic in Japanese society, uh, we can recognize uh, a generic group uh, that was called Hisabetsumi, just sort of discriminated against people, uh, who lived uh, along riverbeds and whatnot. Uh, very often they were uh, people who were poor uh, and lived on the outskirts of some of the larger cities. And uh, during early historical phases, um, you know, they were uh, mobilize uh, to perform particular types of labor uh, within uh, the vicinity of uh, some of the castle towns. Um, and one of these functions would be to, um, you know, dispose of dead human and animal carcasses, right, sort of work that at that point in time was considered, um, you know, polluting, uh, ritually defiling, and so it was something that, you um, they were, uh, again, mobilized to do because no one else wanted to do it. Um, this was a temporary status, right? So uh, I talked about them living along riverbeds and whatnot. People would move in, people would move out, right? Uh, porous boundaries, right? So there's lots of fluidity. They also worked as gardeners. Uh, this is one of the more famous uh, gardens in Japan. Um, and Zen Ami uh, is one of the uh, famous uh, uh, Japanese gardeners, and he is known as a Sansui Kawaramono. So uh, historically, someone connected to uh, these groups of folks that uh, lived in the vicinities uh, of rivers and whatnot, um, and um, just sort of tuck this away in the back of your mind. Um, Zen Ami is someone who is recognized as a very important cultural figure because of uh, his connection with uh, building some of the most famous rock gardens uh, in Japan. Uh, there are also certain performers, uh, Kan Ami and Zen Ami, right? There are also examples of um, people who would uh, perform in um, sort of ritual dances uh, to perform purification rituals. Uh, and over time, right, these types of performances gave rise to um, arts and crafts recognized as sort of symbolic of the Japanese uh, nation. Uh, so we might think of uh, um, 
kabuki, right, and those sorts of performances, right, very stylized, ritualized performances. A lot of their roots go back to some of these, um, you know, sort of uh, specific uh, marginalized communities, and they have historical links to this work of regulating impurity. So it's another scene of uh, um, ancient uh, dance performance. Okay, there were, there was another historical period uh, after this called the Edo period, and it's important because uh, it marks a transition from having these fluid, uh, you know, porous categories to having something that's now uh, going to be regulated more centrally uh, by the government. Uh, and so it's a systematization, right, of discrimination uh, and what I describe as a calcification of status disparities. Um, so the short, uh, the short of it for the Edo period is uh, the government mandates that everybody uh, belongs to um, and be recorded in uh, a temple register. When you're recorded in the temple register, one of the things they note is your status. So something that before right, was sort of fluid, you could move in, move out, once it gets written down, once it can be looked up, it becomes harder to change. Right? You might move, you might move around, but the status goes with you, right? If someone can sort of work, do the detective work, like sort of track out where you came from uh, and look at what you were recorded as. Um, in conjunction with these, uh, with these status disparities, uh, there also um, you know, were created sort of ways of making it a little bit easier to recognize uh, who belong uh, to different groups. Um, so uh, some of the outcasts had to wear particular types of clothes, or they had to um, um, you know, use a particular hairstyle, right, so that their outcast status was legible to others. Um, now, the important thing about the Edo period is, um, you know, we want to understand that the outcasts didn't simply exist in isolation, right, but they were part of, you know, really a continuum of social statuses, right, including uh, groups like the samurai, right, which you are much more familiar with. So if you think of, right, some of the ways you might recognize someone who belonged to the samurai class, right, the same would be true for other groups like merchants, uh, maybe artisans, uh, but also these outcast groups uh, that we're talking about here. Okay, if we move on to uh, what's known as the Meiji period, uh, something really important happens. In 1871, uh, an emancipation edict is issued, right, and all formal status distinctions are eradicated, right? The Japanese government sees um, these status distinctions at the time as being indicative of a certain kind of backwardness. And in their eagerness to modernize, uh, they get rid of these status distinctions. So formally, right, the legal statuses um, are done away with. However, even though the outcasts are liberated from legally sanctioned discrimination, they still face uh, a lot of discriminatory, pra discriminatory practices, right? As many people in Japanese society uh, find themselves unhappy about being placed on the same level uh, as what became no known as new commoners, right? So in the registries, now that you no longer could use, right, these caste uh, designations that had been abolished, they use euphemisms like new commoners, shin uh, to sort of continue to mark, right, this outcast status. Um, so I'm racing through this a little bit, but um, Burakumin established a number of political organizations. The earliest was called Sui Heisha, which started in about 1922. And it was a precursor to uh, what is the largest political organization today, the Buraku Liberation League, uh, what I call the BLL here. Uh, and they did a lot of things to, you know, sort of contest uh, this, uh, you know, systemic uh, discrimination that uh, Brahmin faced in many segments of society. One thing they did was they held denunciation sessions. What was that? Uh, when there was an incident, alleged incident of discrimination, they would invite the perpetrator to a room, uh, maybe about a quarter of the size of this, uh, and subject them, you know, to uh, intense questioning. Right, aimed at confronting right, their prejudicial attitudes. 
Um, they also did things like hold negotiation sessions. They would meet with local leaders, government uh, representatives, uh, and um, appeal right, for the need for different types of government policy to help address uh, the range of their concerns. They also had mass demonstrations, lots of protest activities, right, both locally and nationally. Uh, and they also um, advocated a number of consciousness raising initiatives, uh, again, both within the local community and within Japan more broadly. Uh, these could include um, uh, awareness campaigns, right? They might go out and um, uh, promote awareness uh, of a particular concern, like um, the case of um, uh, Ishikawa uh, Kazuo-san, who was uh, a victim of uh, what would be tantamount to racial profiling, uh, was essentially uh, framed for committing the murder uh, of a high school um, student um, when there was actually very little in the way of factual evidence to connect him to the crime. Uh, they also uh, advocated do DOA education, working with schools uh, to both educate the public about some of the different challenges that Budaku residents face, uh, but also working with schools to help uh, boost the educational attainment of kids living in Budaku areas. Uh, and this is a really important initiative that helped do things like um, secure resources to have uh, extra teachers in the room and to work with students uh, after school uh, to help them uh, improve um, in their uh, educational attainment. And lastly, um, the BLL has been quite active in engaging in a number of international human rights uh, uh, symposia and calling attention to some of the local challenges in Japan by appealing to the rest of the world. And this has been incredibly, um, uh, you know, incredibly important game changer uh, because like many governments, Japan is a little more sensitive uh, when it's being scrutinized right, by its governmental peers in other parts of the world. Uh, and so no country wants to be seen as sort of not measuring up. Uh, and so what I'm trying to capture here is just this idea that um, you know, the members of the you know, Buraku community, you know, they weren't sort of passive, but they were very active in trying to advocate for uh, change and a better society. And they were actually quite effective. Um, here's an image of, it's a little small there, but you can see uh, the image of the actual Budaku community where I did my homework, or did my field work, and you might see that, wow, it doesn't look very impoverished. Well, that's no accident. Um, they, um, through uh, a concerted effort over time, helped secure resources uh, from the government uh, to literally rebuild a number of Baraka communities from uh, the ground up. Uh, and so places that used to be, um, you know, really, um, you know, areas that um, were among the most economically marginal in Japanese society, um, between the period of about 1969 and 1999, when Japan sort of put up a lot of money to uh, invest in infrastructure, a lot of it was directed to uh, Baraka communities um, and during the time that I did my field work, um, you know, this community had resources that very few other communities in the local vicinity uh, could, um, uh, could claim to have. A local clinic, a youth center, uh, a community meeting hall, uh, a senior citizen center. Uh, they even had a pool they, they could use in the summer. Uh, so it was really, really uh, well developed. Uh, and this is part of the fruit that was born of their uh, consistent political efforts over time. I said the communities were rebuilt, uh, you know, improved housing was made available for the residents, uh, and it was subsidized, right? The government subsidized the housing in part. Uh, and they also uh, provided scholarships to Barakamine youth so that they could uh, boost uh, their educational attainment. Uh, and they also helped uh, local members uh, secure employment. Uh, so in all these ways, uh, the government partnered with uh, members of the Baraka community uh, and help try to make a difference on the ground, uh, including right, putting up the money for um, different DOA education initiatives, initiatives. Okay, now that's sort of the historical backdrop. Now let's get to the really fun stuff. Uh, an analogous phenomenon, right? So I, I've talked about this being, um, you know, uh, a case of invisible race. And part of 
uh, that way of thinking about it you know, actually goes back to uh, this book written by George Javos and Hiroshi Wagatsuma uh, back in the 60s. Uh, and it was titled, as you can see, Japan's Invisible Race. And what the book did was um, argue that even though you can't sort of see who's Barakamine, you, they aren't visibly distinguishable uh, like blacks in the United States, um, if you look at the sorts of problems they face, uh, they argue that there are actually a lot of parallels. And so uh, they, think, they thought at the time uh, that this discourse of race was an effective way of trying to make sense of the different challenges that uh, Barack Obama initiatives um, faced. I was skeptical when I first read the book, and that's part of how I got started on this uh, project. I knew a lot had changed in the US since the 60s, um, but uh, not much had been done in the way of follow-up research on Japan's Baraku community. Uh, and so that was um, how I came to settle on this as a long-term research project. Well, it turns out once I got to Japan, even though I was skeptical, uh, a lot of people there also saw connections. For example, uh, I had a number of people uh, when I would go to you know, different uh, meetings and functions uh, related to the BLL, uh, inquire about what was happening with the NAACP. <laughs> of course, I couldn't answer them. I wasn't uh, a member, still a grad student at the time. Uh, also, um, uh, I was, had gone to Japan to do a little bit of research after uh, the Kobe earthquake, uh, and a man accosted me on the street and said, no black power, <laughs> uh, which, you know, uh, I was thinking, okay, it's been a little bit while, a little bit of time since the black power movement, uh, but still, it was an indication of right, some awareness right, of events uh, happening in the United States. Um, and um, probably one of the most poignant examples was when I moved into uh, the community of uh, roughly 500 households where I did my research, um, sort of a welcome dinner, and then suddenly they broke out into song. We shall overcome. So, you know, saying the, ver you know, saying the chorus, and then, uh, you know, we sang the first couple of verses. I actually had to stop because I didn't know the words. Uh, but everybody else kept sing singing. Uh, and sort of what soon became clear to me was, you know, they had a much closer connection to, quote unquote, my history than even I did. Uh, because whereas I was reading things, you know, mostly through books, I grew up a little bit after, right, the peak of the civil rights movement. But for a lot of the people in the community where I was doing my research, they were contemporaries, right? So they were following things in real time, right? And actually, you know, singing, right, some of these songs and whatnot as they were engaging in their own local protests. Um, and so, uh, again, the, the point here is just that, uh, you know, there really was a tangible, meaningful connection there uh, that many people uh, sort of helped me see over time. And the one that I want to think a little bit about um, um, uh, in, in a bit more detail is sort of an invitation I got to participate uh, in an English conversation uh, seminar, uh, sort of looking at issues of human rights in the US and Japan. Uh, it was titled The Rainbow Seminar. Uh, and the invitation came from uh, one of the local uh, stalwarts in the community um, who you know, had long been um, uh, a focal point of a lot of protest efforts. Um, and one of his friends, a constitutional lawyer named Mr. Okada, uh, who, whose impeccable English actually left me feeling like I probably didn't have a lot of value to add to the group. Uh, nonetheless, I accepted the invitation because you know, it was one way to engage in a facilitated discussion uh, of this issue in Japan, this issue of social justice and, and human rights in Japan and the United States, respectively. So, um, you know, we had several meetings to talk about um, you know, the content, and there was a lot of discussion about how to get things started. And his suggestion was uh, that we open with a film that's an American classic. As I put these images on the screen, most of you probably recognize what this is. Uh, guess who's coming to dinner? Right. It turns out, uh, I wasn't too sure how well the film would work. It came out in the 60s, right before I was born. I hadn't really seen it <laughs> beginning to end, although I was vaguely familiar right, with the plot of the story. Um, and uh, Mr. Okada, he was convinced this would be a great way um, to kick off uh, the seminar. I said, well, you know, let me think about it. You know, I went to a local video store uh, and rented a copy 
and watched it beginning to end and were struck by a number of things, right? One, it obviously did a good job of capturing right, some of the tensions uh, playing out in the U.S. at the time, but there were a number of scenes in particular that seemed spot on for thinking about the Buraku issue. And I'll just give one or two examples here. Um, one would be uh, when um, you know, Sidney Poitier's character uh, sort of meets uh, Joey, right, to his fiance's uh, parents. Um, once it becomes clear that he's you know, visiting not just as a casual friend, but as a suitor, uh, the father, some of you may remember this, actually calls his secretary uh, to uh, rearrange his afternoon schedule. I think he had to cancel a golf appointment uh, so he could be at home right, to have dinner with this sudden guest. But he also instructs his secretary to find everything she can uh, on this uh, Dr. Prentice. Uh, and so for me, I thought, aha, this is a, you know, a classic case of you know, what in Japan they would uh, uh, call a mimoto chosa, right, a background investigation. Um, and something that uh, was a clear connection, right, to some of the issues and, and challenges that confronted people um, uh, in Japan, uh, Buraku residents in particular. Uh, the other thing, you know, I talked about the sensitivity, right, of dating and marriage, right? Well, this is sort of at the heart of the film, right? So the connection there, uh, right, is, is pretty clear. The other piece that was interesting uh, was the generational tension between Sidney Poitier's character, Dr. Prentice, and his father. Right, they had different ideas about uh, the best way to overcome some of the challenges of the past. Uh, and that, too, was also something that um, was an ongoing right, sort of uh, point of consternation uh, within the community where I did my research with some of the older uh, residents right, who were on the front lines of the struggle, uh, a little bit uh, irritated, frankly, uh, with some of the youth who didn't uh, you know, seem to have the same sense of urgency about how to deal with some of these problems. So, uh, so I watched beginning to end, and I thought, oh yes, this is going to be great. I can't wait for the first uh, discussion. Um, and you know, we watched the film, and we're waiting with uh, with bated breath. Uh, wait, I just talked about some of these parallels. Uh, one second. Um, wait before I um, go on. This is an example of. The Mimoto Chos I talked about, actually in Japan, this is the kind of uh, background investigation that can be done. This is actually um, an incident that uh, broke out uh, in the middle of my field work. Um, and if you look right here, that's my timer, so uh, uh, I'll try to speed up a little bit. But if you look right here, it says, um, stop, you know, don't even fax. And it says, uh, town leather worker. So I talked about how there are certain occupations that um, you know, were historically associated with uh, people that belonged to this group. Um, you know, one of them was you know, disposing of dead animals. Um, and part of what happened you know, after they uh, sort of dealt with the dead animals is you know, they would um, you know, uh, engage in leather tanning. Right? So leather work uh, is one uh, of the occupations, right, sort of uh, symbolically associated with uh, Buraki areas. And so because this particular community, right, had a leather worker, the deduction was it must be a Buraku community, therefore this job applicant must be, right, Buraku mean. Uh, and here's one more example where um, you see the word D there, uh, which uh, they determined it was to refer to Doa, uh, Doa is a euphemism for Buraku, and it's used to refer to those Buraku communities that benefited from some of the government monies that um, uh, were made available to help rebuild communities. So you could literally go into some of these communities, and um, you know, because of uh, you know the way they were reconstructed, uh, a lot of times with uh, signage, uh, or in the case of the community I showed you earlier, an actual huge statue uh, with a bunch of human rights slogans uh, posted on it. So that, too, would be an indicator uh, for a private eye um, looking into the background of a particular applicant. Um, this notation here, um, you know, I'll say a quick word about it. Yotsu Shushin, four origins. Um, and just to, um, you know, explain what that's referring to, uh, it's sort of indicative of the kind of discrimination and prejudice that Brakami still face, uh, because the implication is um, you know, they walk on four legs, right? 
not two, right, just humans, but four is animals. So uh, you can get a sense of um, the sorts of prejudice that uh, they still encounter, not all the time, right, but occasionally, right, even when uh, doing things like looking for employment. Okay, the best laid plans. You know, we've watched the movie and we're waiting to have this, you know, robust discussion where there are all these connections that I could see, you know, that Mr. Okada could see. And so he calls on um, a young uh, high school student and asks him to, you know, sort of uh, talk about the similarities he sees. And he basically says, it's impossible. And the reason he gives is very simple. He says, blacks are different, so, you know, there's really no way to draw any meaningful comparison. I took it fairly well, you know. <laughs> Inside, you know, there's a little voice saying, you know, speak up, represent your peeps. You know, you should take umbrage at this remark. And, you know, I, I tried to keep it all in, but, you know, I don't think I completely succeeded because his father quickly interjected and said, what are you talking about? You know, there's still Baraka discrimination. And, um, and he sticks to his guns. He says, uh, yeah, there's still discrimination, but Baraku people are not different in any way whatsoever. And so what I quickly came to understand was this wasn't so much a failure, but really an invitation for me to sort of try to step back and, and rethink how I was making sense of the Baraku issue, and in particular, right, how race was playing out. You know, in my mind, you know, I shared a lot of the working assumptions of you know, different scholars right, of Japan who were looking at you know, marginalized groups. You know, uh, I was working within you know, a multicultural framework. That would probably be the easiest way to describe it. Uh, and I've been in a number of situations where I've heard people mention um, you know, Burakamine as one example of another group that highlights sort of a multicultural dimension of Japanese society. But that way of thinking about the Buraku phenomenon right, doesn't really match with Right, sort of um, the point being raised by um, the student, a point which his father did not contradict. Right? There's still Buraku discrimination doesn't really address this question of difference or similarity. Right? And so that omission was something that I also took note of. Um, and uh, the other thing to point out is that, um, trying to figure out how to condense this a little bit, uh, the thing to figure out is we have to uh, sort of consider the question of, you know, how are racial categories operating uh, in Japan? Uh, and are they working with the same sorts of distinctions, within the same sorts of distinctions that we have in the U.S.? And the short answer is no. Uh, and I'll sort of uh, explain really quickly uh, about how uh, this one student, um, you know, arrived at this, you know, uh, conclusion that you know, Barakamine aren't different in any way whatsoever. In Japan, there are lots of um, uh, ideas about the uniqueness of the Japanese. Um, uh, there's a whole body of discourses called Nihonjin Ron, and they have a lot of things in common. Um, one, they presume that Japan and the Japanese are homogeneous, right? They uh, assume that there's a certain purity, um, and they also sort of imagine an isomorphic relationship between geography, race, language, and culture. And so race isn't really something that stands in isolation, but really depends uh, in a really critical way on different types of cultural markers right, to help make some of these distinctions. And this is important because when you think about the sorts of um, um, you know, categories that operate in Japanese society, right, this question of visibility isn't you know, uh, something that applies exclusively to Barakabin. But you think about groups like, you know, Zainichi Koreans. Uh, we would call them, you know, uh, if we were to adopt the vernacular here in the United States, they would probably be, you know, uh, Japanese of Korean descent. But that's not a viable category in Japan. <laughs> you can't be Japanese of Korean descent. You're either Japanese or you're not. And so they're still imagined uh, as being uh, foreigners, even though, um, they were born and raised there and are as culturally fluent in Japanese society as anybody else. So in an interesting way, um, you know, Japanese society sort of um, 
defines itself on the basis of culture, right, and imagines itself as being some removed from these considerations of race, but we can see how race sort of slips in through the back door, and you still have certain groups being uh, marginalized uh, because they aren't, you know, sort of uh, real Japanese. So there are different examples of uh, these Nihonjiron Nihon discourses that play out. Um, here's uh, one of the more innocuous examples. Uh, it's actually an advertisement for a Japanese airline. Attention to detail isn't written in our training manual, it's in our DNA. Uh, and the reason I put this image up is, who, who are we? Who is our DNA? If you're going to try to answer that, it's not immediately clear from the picture, right? We, we see a picture of a, you know, a guy there, but we can't really see him well enough to discern you know, what his background might be. But if we look at the whole image, uh, we notice a lot of um, you know, uh, specific markers, cultural markers of Japanese. So we have uh, you know, uh, an example of Japanese calligraphy here. Um, shodo, right? Uh, ichigo ichi is a Zen expression, right? Uh, another reference to Japan. Uh, he's in um, a washitsu, or Japanese style room. Uh, you can't quite see the tatami mats there, uh, but if you look at what this man is doing, you can see that he's engaging in the tea ceremony, right? So we have, um, you know, really a, a saturation of, of cultural markers of Japanese instead. Um, for some viewers, right, will be immediately apparent and sort of make clear, right, sort of who we are. Um, a funnier one uh, that I saw on a train, uh, I'll just translate it for you quickly, it says uh, rock and pop, or you know, rock music and pop music are okay, but if you're Japanese, uh, shouldn't it be the manyoshu? It's sort of an ancient collection of Japanese poems, uh, you know, that um, uh, it is held in high regard uh, and if you can see here, oops, if you can see here, it's um, uh, actually an advertisement for uh, an app. Uh, so you can read those as you make your way around. So again, uh, the really interesting ways that Japanese-ness is articulated through some of these very strategic uh, connections um, with um, culture, essentialized notions of culture. Okay, uh, final uh, couple of images here. These same distinctions that we were just talking about with respect to um, you know, the, the advertisement um, you know, for the airline and also the advertisement for the new app, we can see something similar playing out uh, in a context that I actually found a little bit surprising. Uh, these are some shots from uh, the Human Rights Museum in Osaka. And what I have here on the top left is an example of, you know, part of the exhibit that deals with uh, Zainichi Korean, right? So the color scheme and sort of the ethnic parade, right? It's a clear example of, you know, sort of a, a diverse presence within uh, Japanese. Uh, same thing with the image here uh, that's uh, aimed at capturing uh, sort of the Ainu or Japan's indigenous population, right? The textiles. Uh, and whatnot, uh, you know, the um, different artifacts featured inside this hut here, all examples of, again, a diverse presence within Japanese society. Contrast that with uh, the example, one of the examples of the exa exhibit on the Baraku issue. Uh, you can see uh, that they're actually manufacturing, right, a taiko drum, right? And, and most of you probably know that taiko Right, is one of the quintessential markers of Japanese and Japanese culture, one that actually circulates the globe uh, as uh, you have uh, taiko troops performing uh, in, different, uh, in different countries, including uh, in Columbus, uh, maybe about four or five years ago. Um, and so what I'm trying to call attention here is sort of a contrast uh, to you know, what we might think of as something more consistent with the multicultural way of or framing things uh, with something here uh, that clearly isn't intended to be multicultural, right? They're not trying to showcase or highlight diversity, uh, but really uh, call attention to the ways that um, how Burakmi may have been uh, outsiders, uh, I'm sorry, outcasts once upon a time uh, due to um, the social hierarchy that were in place, but they were never outsiders to the Japanese nation, right? They would argue they're quintessentially Japanese and that, in essence, is what uh, the young student 
uh, was arguing uh, when he resisted uh, our invitation um, to look for fruitful comparisons. And in my last image here, um, this owl here, it's a human rights poster where um, they're trying to call attention to the need to eradicate Buddhaku discrimination. Uh, but it says on the left side, on the right side here, Konna sabetsu garu nante damage nai desu ka, ningen shokun. So you mean this kind of discrimination exists? Oh, that's just no good. And for the longest time, I kind of wondered what this kind of discrimination referred to. And I think it goes back to uh, this distinction that we're making here, right? Discrimination based on difference makes sense, right? But discrimination against right, people who are essentially the same, right, is somehow um, nonsensical. Um, and so this human rights poster is also, um, you know, sort of, um, um, capitalizing right on this very particular uh, way of identifying uh, Japanese uh, in a way that works to the advantage of this particular group uh, in the way that uh, it doesn't or can't for other groups. I have gone over time, I do believe. Uh, so let me uh, end with one simple thought um, and, and set the stage for a little Q&A. Um, I opened with, with a quote about right, sort of uh, the tension between right, sort of ideals um, and our inability right, to live up to those ideals. And so uh, for me, it was quite surprising to find that right, human rights, right, something that anyone can claim simply by virtue of being human, uh, actually depended on right, different kinds of markers. Regardless of whether we're looking at right, difference and the need to respect difference or um, you know, predicating human rights on right, sort of a shared affinity, um, uh, both of them, right, sort of call the question the need to really mm, think deeply uh, about some of the more productive ways of trying to, uh, to build right, communities uh, that are capable of accommodating everyone. Um, and, you know, Japan is still, you know, sort of wrestling with this issue. Uh, but they're not alone, right? They're not alone. Uh, and so uh, on that note, uh, let me stop and see if there are any questions.